Trevor Etienne is the real deal. This is Locked On Sports Atlanta, and it's time for the Atlanta Football Party, only on Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Atlanta Football Party, your home for the best Atlanta, Georgia Bulldogs football talk. I know it's not really Atlanta, but you know what I meant. It's local insight. You can't get anywhere, but right here at Locked On, I'm your host, Tanitra Batiste. Alongside me are Jarvis Davis and Brian Gephardt. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers, join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. And of course, our Atlanta football party is brought to you by FanDuel. Ah, look, we're starting over. I'm going to tell you why I messed that up. Okay. Because some of the two, one. Welcome into the Atlanta football party, your home for the best Georgia Bulldogs football talk. It's local insight. You can't get anywhere but right here at Locked On. I'm your host, Tanitra Batiste. Alongside me are Jarvis Davis and Brian Gephardt. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. And our Atlanta football party is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, who's going to shine brightest under the lights this season? And is one dog in particular, is his glow up legit? We'll go between the hedges and tackle that in next up. But first, we head back to Athens for spring practice. So Jarvis, we know that Georgia has now wrapped up the first week of spring practice officially. And last week we yeah. talked about some of the bigger questions that we had going into spring practice. Have any of those questions for you been answered, whether that's on offense, on defense, or even on the sidelines with the coaching staff? I think the, the question that has been answered and there's been a lot of buzz going on, like like you said, with those effort, through that first week of practice, it has to be that Trevor Etienne is going to be that guy. That he's, guy. Be, <laughs> he's already shining. He already kind of has gotten acclimated to how they do things at Georgia because when you think about a guy coming from that Florida program where there's a little shaking that's going on, we don't know if the coach is going to be around. It's depending on whether the booster's not going to be able to pony up the money to get rid of him because he just – isn't living up to that Florida um, Gators expectations. So I, mm -hmm. I think that Trevor Etienne is the guy that has already started turning heads on the field. But I think even before then, people, just his mindset coming in, just knowing yes. that he wants to be with a winning program, I feel like Trevor Etienne is is well on his way. I, I said it coming in that, hey, mm -hmm. this guy could be one of those dudes to kind of get one of these postseason awards. And it looks like he's already gotten off to a good start. Yeah, yeah. And Brian, I was hearing good returns from a number of the longtime beat reporters where they're very impressed with, you know, the little opportunity they've had to see and or speak with him. But when we talk about that running back room, we know that it's vaunted. We all we've always called Georgia one of the true RBUs in all of college football. And yeah, just to think that you have somebody like that sort of at the top of the pecking order, that is pretty impressive. But who for you has been maybe that guy or has there been a question that you posed last week or you remember us posing last week where you feel like you're starting to get the answer? Yeah, we've, we've talked about it the last month or two about who's going to be that playmaker in the passing game. Yes. Um, I think between Colby Young, this uh, transfer wide receiver from Miami, mm -hmm. has had rave reviews in that first week of practice. Also, Sakovi White, um, smaller yep. guy, more explosive player. I think what's starting to be answered is that there's going to be playmakers, and it may not be one of these guys that we've talked about already. We've thrown out some of these other names and some of the other transfers, but these two guys have really popped in practice, and I think – you know, the answer that we're getting closer to is, all right, this receiving core is going to be OK. Like the depth yeah. is going to be there, the the spreading of the ball. And that's how they want to run this offense. So um, from what I've been able to see and read and all that type of stuff from practice, I think that those two guys have stepped up quite a bit. And uh, I think this receiving core and this offense are going to be just fine. Yeah. And, you know, this is the type of team and the type of program where it's always loading. It doesn't matter what day of the month or what month of the year, it's loading. So we found out just today that top five-star prospect out of Charlotte, North Carolina, Providence Day School, David Sanders, is 
the number one O tackle in the country, number two overall prospect in the 2025 recruiting class. He's now lined up his official visiting dates, right? So he lined up South Carolina, Clemson, Tennessee, Alabama, Ohio State, and of course, Georgia, where he'll be visiting the weekend of June 7th and BG. When you look at what Sanders brings to the table, is he a good fit for the dogs program? A hundred percent. And the lineage here at, at offensive tackle is starting to get pretty strong for, for yeah. the years. I think Mims is going to be a first rounder this year. You go back to, you got Broderick Jones, Andrew Thomas, Isaiah Wilson, even though he didn't pan out, uh, Isaiah Wynn. Those are just yeah. the first round yeah. offensive yeah. tackles that were taken the last handful of years. So you just look up, and point over here and look at the pedigree. All right, you come here. We're going to get you in this first round. And also, we'll probably try to find a way to, you know, limit your reps along the way, too. So you're not just completely worn going into the league, similar to like what uh, Mims's career has been like. So mm-hmm. uh, I think the biggest obstacle for them, as you look at some of the other schools that are involved, is going to be right. Clemson and Matt Luke, who used to be on that Georgia coaching staff going back a couple of years. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to ultimately come down to those two schools. But, um, you know, if there's a first round offensive tackle going out of Georgia, every year your standard come come be the next one you know come come yeah. be the one, whatever 2027 that it might be oh and to, and to, and to add that add to that bg the real reason why he's a fit six seven two hundred and seventy five pounds we, and we know for a fact that more than likely they're gonna put on about 25 pounds of muscle oh, yeah. once maybe 25 to 30 pounds of muscle once you get into that program because i really feel like like Kirby, the one thing that I that always stands out to me when he first got this job is the fact that he said, hey, we got to get bigger. Just looking at the guys, you know, looking at the offensive linemen and the defensive linemen in, the, in that room. And he's done nothing but do that. Like well, I'm talking about from Jalen Carter to big. Uh, you, you think about, you know, the massive men that he's he's brought in there. I, I just feel like this is. Just a, a really, really good thing for for the for the dogs to be in on this kid because like he fits the bill. He fits the bill, and, and he understands. I'm sure he understands the type of coaching that he's gonna get if he walks through that door as well. Yeah, yeah, and I I too think going back to what BG said about that lineage, I think it's important because you do look at an Isaiah Win who just had the opportunity to re-sign with the Dolphins, a quality program, a quality team, a team that's Mm -hmm. trending up, right? And you know how I feel about Broderick Jones. Hey, Broderick Jones, we appreciate (laughs) you so much for your versatility in Pittsburgh and what you were able to do there. But then you also talk about Amarius Mims. So when you start stacking those success stories, I think that can be very appealing as well. Yeah, 100%. And to Jarvis's point as well, like just look at this last group that came in. These guys are massive like 275 yeah. is is small to that point i mean you talk about right, 20, yeah. 20, right. 25 pounds and i think the coaching staff and everybody and nutrition group and strength and conditioning like they're looking at this guy going all right we can make this guy i mean he's already this but we can really make him into that it would almost be kind of an interesting situation just to see what bringing a guy that's under 300 pounds and a good bit under 300 pounds right now and, and how they could develop him and and bring him up to that next level um, it, it's crazy some of the size of, of some of these kids coming in. So um, if, if David Sanders were to come to Georgia, I think it would be a, an excellent choice for him. And, um, and and we've seen it. It's just been the last a handful of years of, of great offensive linemen that have come through there. Yeah. And I saw a picture earlier today of one of the centers and he's like, you know, still in that six, five, six, seven space, but kind of like a, a slim fr- frame. And I was like, yeah, let's see him midsummer. That ain't going to be the same. I literally was just saying that before we had this conversation, because like you said, that's how they kind of build them. You come in and you already have the stature as far as the height is concerned. Mm -hmm. So now we just need to get you that girth and really put you into a body that's more pro style. And that way, when we start to run that pro style offense, you've got the mindset, you've got the body, you've got the conditioning, you have everything that you need in order to be prepared Number one, like I said, to run this pro style of offense, but number two, to potentially turn and become pro. When we come back, we'll talk about rising stars when we go between the hedges. This episode of our Atlanta football party, the dogs edition is brought to you by Nissan and Amazon Fire TV. Now, this week's March Madness bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we are picking a team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys will be able to take it to the next level. So let's start with UConn. 
the Yukon Huskies can only be described as an armada, this top seeded and not just top seeded team, the number one overall seed in the men's basketball tournament is as hardcore as it gets. So it's no wonder they've landed the top overall seed. They're one of the favorites to win it all, despite four of the six power six conference champions standing in their way in the East region. Then you got the Auburn Tigers. They can be described as kind of a pathfinder. They've been thrilling to watch and have really created a lane for themselves after claiming the top spot in the SEC as they knocked off the Florida Gators in the SEC tournament championship. They're set to also make a run in the NCAA tournament. Then you got the Oregon Ducks, more like a Nissan Rogue. The team absolutely surprised us all with a powerful performance in that final Pac-12 tournament, punching their ticket to the big dance. They say, win life, go Rogue, and that's exactly what the Ducks have done here. So take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or that Nissan Armada, and don't forget to go find your next big adventure. And how do you do it? by going to nissan.usa.com to go shopping. That's nissanusa.com. This episode of our Atlanta football party is also brought to you by Amazon Fire. Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experience with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. I can attest to that. I have three of them in my house and I can attest to that Fire Stick being a really, really cool tool because I picked up one for my nephews. They loved it so much. I picked up one for my mom as well. Now, Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. So you can see our pictures splashed all across your big TV screen if you so choose. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all of the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports, March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos as well. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Learn more by visiting www.amazon.com slash locked on fire TV. So guys, it's time for the deep dive. Of course, we're still kind of in our list season, right? And ESPN, of course, dropped its list of breakout players for each of the top 25 teams. Of course, Georgia is the number one team in the country preseason. And they started off by just kind of walking us through the backstory of, of course, the departure of Jamon Dumas Johnson, who transferred from Georgia to Kentucky, and that the Bulldogs are kind of looking for someone to start next to Smale Mondin in the middle of that defense. And they pointed out Raylan Wilson. They said he kind of showed flashes, of course, after suffering that knee injury in preseason camp. But he's one of those guys that was really a coveted linebacker prospect, was named to the SEC All-Freshman team, and is one of the fastest runners in the state of Florida in the 100-meter dash and was once clocked at, get this, 24 miles per hour on a GPS. So, BG, that's one of the guys that they said they expect to have a breakout season. How about you? Is it for, for you, is it him? Or are you seeing, in addition to Raylan Wilson, anyone else who might be a breakout star? No one that big should be running 24 miles per hour. Like, that's, an alarm, <laughs> that's an alarming number. Like that's, a massive that's individual. Wild. That's great. Like, 24 is scooting. So, first off, that's that's just nuts. Uh, for me, it's it's one of the other linebackers who I don't know if we got the full breakout towards the end of last year, and that's C.J. Allen. I, and just in the sense of yeah, I think people know about him, know the name. He came on late, became the starter. You know, he's going to be the signal caller, all those things. But I think he very quickly and early on in the season, maybe in that first game against Clemson, winds up being, all right, is this guy one of the best linebackers in the country? Like, I think yeah. he's going to get into that conversation pretty pretty quickly. And, you know, if you have Wilson come along and Schmel Munden coming back and C.J. Allen, then all of a sudden this linebacking core is starting to look pretty pretty stout. Uh, but I think C.J. Allen, whether he already broke out or not, has a whole nother level to get to, and we're going to see it early and often this season. Yeah, I, I think one of the things – I think Raylan is, 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 is interesting to me because when you think about what he was able to bring to the table last year and, and all the things he had to deal with, get, you know, like he got – like um, T mentioned – I think he's the type of player that can be like that unsung hero 
Uh, because like you talked about CJ Allen being the play caller and everything, BG. I think Raylan Allen is that Raylan Wilson, excuse me, is that guy that can come in and be that that that's that stabilizer, right? We know what Smell Monday brings to the table. You know, he's gonna be the veteran guy, you know, and, and be the leader of that group. But I think Raylan Wilson is a guy that can be the guy to come in and make plays for you when you need them. Like he could be that that the initiator of 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 uh, on a third down, third and long, or be be the guy to come in and, and break up a particular play on 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 a, a very important play in the, in the key moments in the game. Yeah, and for me, and I know we talked about him before, but he's just intriguing to me. I mean, Travis Atien is just intriguing to me because you think about as good as he was at Florida. I still feel like they only scratched the surface with him. So when I think breakout star, I think he's going to, and and when I say this, I want to be careful because we've seen a very interesting run in the NFL for running backs in free agency, right? So maybe that's kind of indicating that running backs are kind of reestablishing their worth, but it's also a running back core in free agency that is a bunch of good pass catchers. And I think those ATN and I, you know, throw Trevor in there as well, but the ATM boys, that's what they do. Like, yeah, they're, they'll run you off the, off the field, but they're also good at pass catching. And I just think he's going to be an opportunity. He's going to have an opportunity, especially as the o- offense continues to open up. And we start to see that guy in Carson Beck. He's the guy where I'm like, man, listen, I think that we're going to see some things in Travis that we're like, I think he's going to amaze us. So he's kind of that guy where I, I put quotes around breakout, but I just think we're going to be like, mm, Travis ATN hits different in Athens versus how he hit in Gainesville. So it'll be interesting to kind of see what happens there. And we've been talking about the evolution, the soap opera that is the college football playoff and how every week it seems like there's a different iteration of what it's going to be. Right. So we started off a couple of weeks ago saying, okay, okay, it's official. It's 12 teams this coming season. Then there was the chatter about, oh, no, wait, let's start talking about 14. And you even haven't, haven't even seen how the 12 team playoff is going to work. Well, now 14 is pretty much solidified for 2026. But ESPN had an interesting article, Jarvis, about the fact that it's still not a broken system necessarily, but it certainly is not a well-oiled machine, this college football playoff. So it kind of pulled back to the days of BCS and said, hey, there may be some ways that we can kind of tweak this even more so than just adding teams to make it work. What are your thoughts on that article about the possibilities of making this an even more effective way to crown a college football champion? I think one of the things that it pointed out when you talk about, you know, picking the teams, because obviously they're going to be biased. And when yep. when human beings come out and say, yes, we're just basing it solely off of this year and that's it. Like that's bull crap <laughs> because yeah. you can't tell you yep. can't tell me that uh, uh, a team coming off yeah, of back to back national champion in the Georgia Bulldogs and lost to the uh, lost to the in the SEC championship game to, uh, against Alabama. How can you not have some context and say, you know what, right. this is the back-to-back national champion. This is, and then from the money standpoint, it's just from a viewership standpoint because that we know that's what ma- that what matters because the, yeah. they go they went to a fourteen team playoff because Big Ten SEC say, hey man, we're gonna get more money than all of y'all and we're gonna make the final decision and we'll yeah. and y'all get y'all a little money and y'all little pets and stay down there and we're gonna mm-hmm. continue to do what we do and make sure we get the most right. money out of this whatever the deal is we're gonna get the most money so you can't tell me that money doesn't matter so I think that overall they just have to. I think just be more upfront about it, right? We're talking about we're paying players. Like the whole NIL thing had to come about before we even got to this point. Now people are talking about it's out of hand. It's out of hand because you didn't control it or address it. If you don't address how these teams are being picked, which I feel like it'll be a little bit more easier to deal with because it's more teams. You feel more teams. It's um then everybody, mostly everybody's going to be happy. And and I think that that's probably going to be the case, especially when you're talking about 14 teams. Because if yeah. the 15th and 16th teams, I'm like, oh, we should be in. Uh, you know, yeah. all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, you probably yeah. got two or three losses and and, and, and people are going to and really don't have a chance to win and that's a championship. So I think that having more teams can fi- fix the issue as far as people complaining. But I think oh, the big issue for me is, hey, like you have to take in 
previous seasons because you have to look at the big picture part of it as well and not necessarily drill down into one season. Yeah. This should be it should be must watch TV if they were to just open this up, like put the camera in the room. If we got nothing to hide, let's put it all on the table. Yep. They could sell the crap out of that show. And it's all about money anyways. So yeah. I would watch that in a heartbeat because I don't I don't even watch the, you know, roll out. All right, here are the rankings this week. Here are the rankings next week. Because yeah. they don't really matter until later yeah. on. It, it's it's yeah. sort of felt like you, you, we watched it at first because we were college football fans. But then it's just like, all right, just let me know what the rankings are. But if you were to tell me we were a part of that conversation and that discussion and there was like a forum to it, that yeah. would be incredible. And the powers that be will never let that happen, which is silly because – the, the ratings for that would be incredible for any like right. non-sporting event that that would be legit. Mm. And the other thing too, going from 12 to 14 so quickly, the way that they wrote it is this is still up to the sec and the big 10 pretty much to decide how many guaranteed teams they left. It yep. so open ended. <laughs> I mean, what is this going to wind up being eight sec and big 10 teams? It's like, all right, a couple conference champions, group of five, right. ACC, maybe you get two in this year, maybe, you know. Yeah, so, two victims, uh suing yeah. to try to get out the conference right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the ACC, the like, All right. Just, let us have that conversation. Let us be a part of it. And it feels because it changes so even this, like this past year, even though it was four, like, what did you think about FSU throughout the year? What what happened that, you know, you needed to get to? We know we had injuries, but I think that that conversation would be fascinating and uh, create even more fodder for, for us in podcasts like this. I think it would be really entertaining. Yeah, I think so, too, because right now, I think collectively in real talk, I would love to talk to one of those committee members after they've served their term to say, OK, yeah. real talk. Every time you walked out of the room, did you really feel like you understood how you guys got to those final four? Because right. I think the answer is going to be no. Yes. I, I promise you, I don't yeah. think they all know. I think they walk out and they have, you know how we call it, the meeting after the meeting. Oh, I think there are probably like four or five meetings after the meeting, like, what the heck just happened? <laughs> it's a, how do we it, make that decision? Look, it needs to be like how they have you know interview rooms, like blur their face out, change the voice and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a cartel documentary all of a sudden. Right. Like, oh, love it. Must see Wait, what? Yes, <laughs> at, yes. Because right now it still feels like a fog. No matter what they say, no matter how they stack up the criteria, it still makes no more sense than when we're having a conversation on other locked on shows about whatever the heck happened with these 64 and the seating for this March Madness. To me, it's like December madness when it comes to the college football playoff, just, just mm -hmm. point blank. But anyway, we're going to talk about some things that were maddening in a different way. Sorry to this man, JC. We'll talk about it on the other side. <laughs> this episode of our Atlanta football party is also brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney, which is good because it seems like this season there have been so many busted polls, college football or college basketball polls, that it's inevitable that the bu busted brackets are on the way. But FanDuel will still let you get around that. Whether you're betting on a big upset or one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. So there's an opportunity for you, even if your bracket gets busted, if you get it to that final team, whether it's U of H or it's UConn, whoever you think it's going to be, there's still an opportunity for you to win. So just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets in about three weeks. Again, the first four starts tonight, so get cracking. It's fanduel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. So guys, it is also mock draft season, and it seems like every day we're getting multiple mock drafts, but there were a couple that dropped just this morning that have now placed Brock Bauer squarely in the top 10. Uh, several of them actually have him going at number 10, which would be going potentially to the Jets. But do you guys feel, I mean, Jarvis, do you feel like teams that have him at that top 10 or even at number 10 or even in the top 10, do you feel like he's worth it or that he is a viable top 10 tight end for this draft class? 
To be honest with you, before, if we take in, like, just take out the whole financial piece, right? Because that's a whole, you know, a yeah. different part of the discussion, I feel. Just from a talent standpoint, this guy deserves to be a top five pick, in my in my opinion, because he's just that talented. He's, yeah. like, when you talk about, I, I love, this is why I love college football more so than college basketball, because, like, we talking about a guy coming in, you're able to follow along with his career. That's yes. why I feel like the fandom has kind of drifted from the college basketball because you can't oh, get for sure. players. And, like, when you have a guy like Brock come in and do what he did in his freshman season, then you come back and do what he did in his sophomore season and junior season and help being the catalyst for that offense to win back-to-back -back national championships, the dude – the dude is just so freakishly athletic. For him to have a serious conversation about running up against Lad McConkey, who's probably half his size, and say he can run the same amount of 40 times, if not better. Like right. it just it just it just speaks to the type of talent. This dude just oozes talent for me. And I feel like in the right offense, he can be a game changer. And I think, and I know like some of the best tight ends that are in the NFL right now, those guys were drafted in the mid-rounds. Just look it up. From George Kittle to Travis Kelsey, all yep. those guys were drafted in the mid-round. And I think that people are starting to change their ideals as far as, you know, for, from a positional standpoint, mm -hmm. the type of effect that those, those, those tight ends can have in the NFL. Yes. But I just feel like just strictly from a talent standpoint, this dude is, not only deserves to be a top 10, but he, he deserves to be a top five pick because he's just that talented. And BG, I thought about him today because I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole looking at tight ends who can fit in and play successfully and effectively in the slot. And of course, like you said, Travis Kelsey came to the top of the list, George Kittle, Dallas Goddard came to the top of the list. And I was mm -hmm. like, you know, Bob Bowers has those kinds of Travis Kelsey powers, George Kittle powers, you know, Dallas Goddard, the versatility that he brings to the table. But to and that's why, to your point, Jarvis, if a team decided that they wanted to go top five or top eight and BG, if they decided that even before the Jets snag him, they wanted to snag him, I don't think they'd lose on that bet. No, I don't think so. I mean, I he's a slam dunk top 10 guy to me for, for sure. I, I think Marvin Harrison is the number one skill player, position player, I think best overall player in the draft, honestly, all of those things. But mm -hmm. after that, it would be Brock Bowers from a, from a pass catching standpoint. I think neighbors yeah. is, is kind of right in that neighborhood, if you will. But um, I'm interested to see how other teams perceive the position in terms of, all right, Kyle Pitts, does he scare people away for how early he was drafted? But then you look yeah. at the success that you had with some of the rookie tight ends this past year in a Sam Laporta or a Dalton mm -hmm. Kincaid and teams that made a deep run and these tight ends were a big part of it. So yep. Um, I think the only concern is the slight lack of size if you do want to use him, but he's a very willing blocker in that way. So it depends mm -hmm. on the system. But if you're just looking for a playmaker, you need a tight end. I mean, this guy has done it for, you know, multiple years. He's yes. one of the best, you know, probably the best college tight end that's ever played the game and one of the best Georgia players of all time. And that's, you know, saying a that's lot. That's saying a lot. Yeah, but it's true. The guys that have, that have come out of here. So yeah, I just think it's a it's a no doubter that he's going to be a success, kind of regardless of where he winds up going. Although I really hope it's not the Jets. Same. <laughs> For so On so many levels. Baby. Yeah, so many different levels. Yep. <laughs> yes, I know why. So, but with, <laughs> but I just want to add to what you're saying, BG. I, I think when you look at where Laporta was drafted, I feel like there was – a, a lot of surrounding talent, meaning the quarterback was was solid and in, in play. Yep. And I think that for teams that don't necessarily have that position solidified, and I think it's probably about make a case for like eight or nine teams that aren't settled at the quarterback spot. That's why you know Kyle Pitts. Kyle Pitts didn't have that much success. I mean, I put some of it on on the quarterback, but I also put some of it, some of it on not necessarily living up to that that draft position. But I just yeah. don't think that. Brock Bowers is that guy. Right. All he has to do is just re remain healthy because I obviously watched him a lot more so than I did Kyle Pitts in college. But I, I think it might do him some good for him to go outside the top 10 because we know the further down he goes, the yep. better team it is, the better quarterback it is because, oh, my gosh, if he messed around and, and got drafted by the Bengals, do you understand how – like Ooh. unfair that would be <laughs> and all the single coverage you would get in the AFC North that's a great call that actually is a great call yeah and and I I'll often think that as well like I you hate to waste that talent and that's that's one of the seven reasons that 
you know, we don't want him to go to the Jets either because it would be like an absolute waste. But you know who didn't waste their talent or leave any crumbs? Anthony Edwards and Jalen Johnson on Monday night left zero crumbs, wasted none of their talents, used all of their superpowers. So former dog Anthony Edwards literally posterized poor little Tink Tink, a.k.a. John Collins, in the Wolves Jazz game Monday. And then Collins replaced <laughs> I can't look at you guys with a straight face, dang it. But John, John Collins' replacement of uh, in the body of and form of Jalen Johnson for the Hawks then returned the favor. So it was literally like as you were catching your breath on what Anthony Edwards did to John Collins in the Wolves Jazz game, then all of a sudden you see Jalen Johnson going viral for what he did to Austin Reeves in the Hawks uh, uh, Lakers game, right? And so I ask you guys, BG, who dunked it best? Ant-Man or JJ? <laughs> Both of those were were awesome. It's almost like unfair to compare the Jalen one to Ant-Man just based on what he's done. But yeah. I like you saw the dunk. It was incredible. And it was incredible in real time and the body and the poster and all of that. But I think one of the special things about it was him watching it after the game. <laughs> yeah. Himself, and kind of looking up going, oh, that's he was like shocked that he did right. that, that. He could do that. And He's already kind of become that player the last year or two, but uh, yes. he's not, he he might be at the top of the list of the most must-watch player in the NBA right now. Like it's just it's incredible what he's doing, and to, and to throw it in with highlights like that, he had the oop off off the glass to himself a little bit earlier in the season. Like yeah. he's incredible, um, and and what he did, uh, I'd give him the uptick over over what Jalen Johnson did, even though what Jalen did was was pretty special too. Yeah, I really like what Jalen Johnson brings to the table, but I'm with you, BG. When you talk about the perpetrator of the dunk hurt himself. <laughs> he dislocated his, his hand, right, right, like literally. Yeah. You know, like that is like unimaginable. Like right. how you dunk this about hard, you, so hard that you dislocate your finger. Yeah, uh, and, and just for just the way that John Collins just curled up, Austin Reeves kind of gave up. He knew what yeah, time. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, it's going he down. Did, yeah, he no just laid on his back. It was like was okay. Like, Oh man, like he put it's like that the dude in the fetal the bully... position. Right, he was in the fetal position. <laughs> it's almost like, hey, you know that bully said, Hey man, I'm gonna get you out the meet me at the school tree. You, you gotta go by the tree, you know, the apple tree at, at, at the end of school, and you gotta right. go by, you know, you gotta go there because you don't want to be, you know, wanna be no punk. But uh -huh. it's it's almost like you know you're gonna lose, and but you gotta at least act like you, you wanna be there. And that's kind of how John was. He was like, Man, I know I got athleticism, but Ant-Man is on a whole nother level. But, yeah, he is quickly becoming one of my favorite players in the league. So, yeah, and it's oh, good yeah. that he's a former dog. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, and that reminds everybody that one of these good days, we know that the basketball team went off to a great start and then kind of swooned. And now we'll, of course, know that they're going to be in that NIT tournament tonight or at the NIT uh, against George, uh, Xavier. But, yeah, when you see players like that, it's like, yeah. I'm only going to give my guy Jalen Johnson a little bit of a shout out because he still stepped over Austin Reeves and looked down at dude and was like, what? And that's just a Jalen Johnson. We don't get to see enough. And we're always right. talking about no pun intended with what I'm about to say, but we're always talking about the Hawks not having that dog. Well, Jalen Johnson showed some dog last night, but yeah, Anthony Edwards, I was like, okay, so we already had dunk of the year, like right here. This, this is it. This yeah. is absolutely it. Listen, we appreciate you guys for stopping by the Atlanta football party. You're home for the best Georgia Bulldogs football talk, and we'll sprinkle in a little basketball when it's at, man. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we're free and available wherever you download your podcasts. Make sure you come back for the Atlanta sports party Thursday.